Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. That is so much better. I feel loved. All right, so I'm Dr. Marilyn Mobley, Vice President for Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's Power of Diversity lecture series. Our speaker today, you'll, uh, I'll introduce in a moment, but I wanted to share just a couple of items with you. Our Power of Diversity series is our way of giving um, exposure, visibility to our own faculty and staff. It began for our own faculty, then we added staff, and it's a way of sharing with the campus community. It was an opportunity to present our own faculty and staff with opportunities to share their research, their scholarship, or their community service in whatever form their work takes. It's a way to share with the campus community what's happening. We then added national thought leaders who also um, assist us with guest speakers who are national thought leaders. Many of our own faculty are national thought leaders. I always want to correct myself when I do that. We have members of our campus community who are national thought leaders. And then we invite guest speakers uh, as part of the series also. So we thank you for how you have participated in this series with our guest speakers. And we are happy today to have um, a member of our faculty from the Mandel School of Social Sciences. Before she speaks, I wanted to share our uh, program. In case you didn't get it, we hope you'll get the flyer for the remaining speakers of the series. Edwin Mays, who's our Director of First Year Experiences and Family Programs, will be speaking on March 26. Dr. J.P. Stevens will be speaking uh, on April 3rd. He's from the Weatherhead School of Management. We also hope, because it is Black History Month, and we are happy about that, we celebrate Black History all year, 365 days of the year. But we know that Carter G. Woodson designated a week that we have now expanded to a month. And so we continue to celebrate the month even though we know we celebrate this particular history all year long. And in celebration of it, there are a few programs remaining. Uh, one that we want to call to your attention, we're doing a screening on the 25th of I Am Not Your Negro, which is based on the life and words of uh, James Baldwin. And some of my students know I'm teaching a course right now on Toni Morrison James Baldwin and ta Coates. And so I'm really looking forward to how this screening, which takes place at 6 o'clock PM in Strosacker, we look forward to how this screening will help us think about issues of race in America. That's it for my announcement. So now I want to move to, announce, to introducing our speaker. Adrian Crawford Fletcher is Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and an assistant professor at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. She is also a member of the university's Diversity Leadership Council. And I'm so happy, sometimes people join the campus community and they raise their hand and they say, how can I contribute? I love people like that. And she is one of those people. Dean Gilmore has been supportive of her presence on our Diversity Leadership Council. And she's been an active member. Some people join something and they just show up and sit down. She's been an active member, so thank you, uh, Dr. Fletcher. Prior to her positions here at Case Western Reserve, she served as an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay. Dr. Fletcher's, Dr. Fletcher's research focuses on the influence, of, the influence of implicit attitude amongst service providers, social services, law enforcement, healthcare, housing, et cetera, and the phenomenon of disproportionality. She has been a practicing social work professional for the past two decades with work experience in child welfare, foster care, psychotherapy, Indian child welfare, court appointed special advocates, and veterans. The woman has been busy. In addition, Dr. Fletcher facilitates discussions regarding the intractable thicket of race. I love this language the intractable thicket of race and culture on campus, as well as for various agencies and organizations. She earned a PhD from Loyola University Chicago and a master's degree in social sciences from the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Social Sciences here at Case Western Reserve University. We are delighted that Dr. Fletcher agreed to participate in our spring Power of Diversity lecture series, and we look forward to her lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fletcher, who will speak on socially just, anti-oppressive, and woke phenomena. <laughs> Ooh. 
she's making me use this. Thank you, Dr. Mobley. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you all for being here today. I want to say a special thanks to all of the provost scholars who are in the room. And if I can out you all, may I ask you all to stand, please? Yeah. All of the provost scholars who are in the room today. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. All righty. So hopefully what we discussed this afternoon bears some importance, but honestly, it is only as important as what you, the listener, take away this afternoon, right? So what we're gonna talk about is not rocket science, but at the same time, it is rather difficult because it will require a paradigm shift on your behalf and on mine. So I propose to you today that on that wonderful day that you were born, on your birthday, you came into this world with the full capacity to be socially just, anti-oppressive, and woke. On your birthday, you came into the world with the full capacity to be socially just, anti-oppressive, and woke. Somebody define socially just for me. What is social justice? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Okay. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Thank you. Somebody else? Yes? Design systems and interactions which strengthen the vulnerable members of the society. Okay. So design systems and interactions that strengthen the vulnerable members. Okay. So you're talking systems and you're talking individuals. Good. I saw another hand. Um, I was just going to say equal rights for all members of society. Okay. Equality for everyone. Yes. Equality and equity. Equity. Good. Good. I saw another hand. I know I saw it. Anybody else? All right. All right. So social justice or socially just and awareness of oppression coupled with action. It has to involve action. So we need to be moving toward all three of the definitions that we're given. And it has to happen on the individual level, the middle level, and the upper level, all three levels, all right? It also requires social empathy, all right? What is anti-oppression? Somebody define it for me. Yes. Not oppressing people. Good. What does that mean? What does it look like? Yes. Treating people fairly. Good. What else? Yes. Um, standing up against uh, oppression when it occurs. Standing up against oppression. Perfect. <coughs> Opposing unchallenged norms. So when it happens, we need to lean into it. That was perfect. Thank you. We need to be mindful of microaggressions. What are microaggressions? We've been hearing a lot about microaggressions in the news and in other places. What are microaggressions? Yes? Um, often implicit biases or assumptions that we make mm -hmm. um, based on categories that people identify as. Correct, correct. They are intentional and unintentional. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether they are intentional or unintentional. They still leave an impact, correct? Mm -hmm. Good, good. So they are also widespread, repeated, systemic injustices. Thank you. You knew I was going to trip on that, didn't you? All right. So one more. So we have socially, so we have socially just, anti-oppressive, and woke. What is woke? What does it mean to be woke? Here, and then we'll go here. Yep. To be aware of how the um, systemic racism has um, impacted everyone. Okay. In society. Okay. Good. Next. To be well informed about the events that uh, exhibit oppressive behavior. Okay. So to be well informed. Good. Yes. They said what I was going to say. They said what you were going to say. They cheated. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? What does it mean to be woke? Yes. I think it means to be open and listening. Okay. 
I'm ready to hear whatever okay. is happening. So ready to hear. I like that. So if you're woke, you get it. It's like waking up. It is a sudden understanding. And I really like the ending of the definition. It is when you begin to push past the narrative. It's when you begin to relinquish the, when you begin to relinquish the authorship <coughs> of the story to the one who is having the experience. Stop telling somebody else's story. Let me tell my story. And I'm gonna let you tell your story. So if you're woke, you get it. If you're woke, you get it. So, we all woke up with the full capacity to be socially just, anti-oppressive, and woke. According to Dr. Caroline Leaf, who was a communication pathologist and audiologist who worked in the area of cognitive neuroscience, in 1985, she wrote a text, or oh, she's been working in the, that area since 1985. We are all wired for connection. We're wired for the care of each other. God bless you. We're wired for the care of each other. We are wired for helping individuals to live their best lives. We are wired to, for the desire for our own selves to live our best lives. Who in this room doesn't want to be their best self? Who in this room doesn't want to live their best life? So according to Dr. Leaf, we have a desire to be our best selves. We also are wired to help other individuals to be their best selves. In short, at birth, our mental circuitry and our mental motherboard was wired only for the positive. Leaf said in her 2013 book, that we have what is called a natural optimism bias wired into us. So our original default mode was not mode was not only for ourselves, but for our, but for others too. And this natural default mode leads us for a desire to be our best selves and to lead others to be their best selves. Very simply put, when we woke up on our birthday, we were fully wired with the desire to be our best self. But it goes both ways. We also were wired to help others to want to be their best self. There's not a child in the world who doesn't have a wish to be the president, an astronaut, a doctor, when they are younger. They all have these wishes, right? Valerie just mentioned that you have little people, right? And little people have big dreams. They are wired with a natural optimism bias, correct? No one wakes up with the wish to end up incarcerated, be addicted to heroin. No one wakes up with the wish on the other side of the coin to drive someone toward incarceration or to drive someone toward becoming a heroin addict, right? Because we all have that natural optimism bias, but something happens to interrupt that. So we all have a wish to help individuals live their best lives. When I was a senior in high school, I was preparing to graduate and I was sitting across from my guidance counselor and she looked at my little brown face and she looked at my grades and she looked at the Ohio Achievement Test that I had just taken and she looked at my class ranking. My Ohio Achievement Test suggested that I was reading at a fourth grade level. And so she said to me, her recommendation was, you should not go to college, all right? So we would call all of that a form of predictive analytics. So as a result of predictive analytics, my well-intentioned, mind you, well-intentioned, she meant no harm. Guidance counselor said to me, it would be best for you to pick up a trade. And it wasn't because she thought I was creative that she suggested that I go to cosmetology school. Like, I think I'm edgy now. I wasn't edgy then, <laughs> right? All right? 
But thankfully, I had parents at home who said, you will be going to college, right? So off I went to the University of Cincinnati, and for the first time, I saw instructors who looked like me. And there were also instructors who didn't look like me. But for the first time, a counselor sat across from me, and they asked me, who do you want to be when you grow up? And I thought, me? So for the first time, someone asked me about who I wanted to be. By the end of the first quarter of my college career, I had landed squarely on the dean's list. So what happened to that little girl who, for whatever reason, was reading at the fourth grade reading level, right, at the end of her high school career, and suddenly, three months later, was on the dean's list. So we're going to talk about what happened in those three months as we move further down. But right now, we're going to focus on what happened with that guidance counselor to interrupt her natural optimism bias so that she was unable to see the potential in the little girl who was sitting across from her. So what then are the interrupters to our natural optimism bias? But before we get to that, I want to show you what natural optimism bias looks like in a little girl. Did you see that? Tell me what you saw. What did you see? You saw a ballerina. What else did you see? Um, I was going to say um, the hashtag uh, carefree black girl. Mm -hmm. Carefree black girl. Dig deeper for me. What did you see? Confidence. Confidence. Yeah. You saw yeah. confidence. What did you see? No shame. No shame. Mm -hmm. She, in that moment, was living her best life. Right. What were the other little girls around her doing? They were watching her. They wanted to be her. In that moment, they were, ch how was she doing this? She was living her best life in that moment. Right. And if she had continued on that journey, they may have started to do the same thing, live their best lives. In that moment, she was living her best life. Right. So what is it then that interrupted my high school guidance counselor's natural optimism bias? So socially, our socialization, especially here in the US, teaches us to believe in the inferior and the superior, the good and the bad, the smart and the ignorant, the right people to date and the right people to marry, the wrong people to date and the wrong people to marry. And I know it's necessary for our minds to take shortcuts because we take in so much information across the course of the day and it's just necessary for us to kind of limit the information that we're taking in. But I just wonder, what is the price that we pay for the categorization of people, the categorization of each other? And what does that actually do to us in the long run? So that's the cost of socialization here in Western society. After the Second World War, with the inception of the GI Bill, our neighborhoods became intentionally segregated. Neighborhood associations cropped up in large cities like Chicago and Cleveland and New York and LA and Dallas, and redlining became a thing. All of these intentional acts assured that you would live on one side of the tracks and I would live on the other side of the track. And it became harder for you to care about me being my best self and live my best life. And it became harder for me to care about you being your best self or living your best life. 
So this further entrenched our separate socializations and it wired in a further interruption of our own natural optimis optimism bias for each other. Hence, as I said, it became harder for you to seek my best self and for you to seek and for me to seek your best self. So here we are with the mental maps and schemas wired in about ourselves and others based on what people look like, based on what people don't look like, based on how we dress or how we don't dress, based on what we eat or what we don't eat, based on where we live or where we don't live, based on our facial features and our hair texture and all of those wonderful things that really don't amount to anything. So let's usher in the theoretical perspective of D.W. Winnicott and object relations to help us tie all of this together and push us forward. So in effect, our experiences during our formative years, our socialization, habitus, mental maps, and schemas facilitate the creation of what D.W. Winnicott referred to as object relations. Object relations, or I'm sorry, our internal objects are a mental representation or an emotional impression of the other person. It is the representation that we hold especially when the person is not physically present. And it also influences how we view the person when they are present. So we have an internal representation of the people who live on the other side of the tracks they also have an internal representation of us as a result of socialization, habitus, and mental maps, right? So we have this internal representation. And as you can see, here we are with this internal representation. There's a neutral face up front, directly behind. It's hard to tell, but there's a frowny face. And on this side, there's a happy face. And I just happen to know that I have a student in, in this class who loves D.W. Winnicott, Catherine. I'm calling her out because she loves this theory. So the internal object is a whole representation of the person, both good and bad. And we all have internal representations of other folks, especially people who live on the other side of the tracks. And that's OK. It's OK except when something unconscious begins to happen. So D.W. Winnicott said, an awareness of the unconscious is imperative as our unconscious world, that should say world, not would, our unconscious world of relationships may in many ways be more compelling than our external world of interactions and relations. So what D.W. Winnicott is suggesting is that what is going on in here is way more important than what's going on out here. Right. So you could be standing in front of me, Catherine, and if my internal representation of you is negative, if I don't like you, you could be doing a dance in front of me, and I have cognitive dissonance going on all day long. So what's going on on the inside of me unconsciously is often more compelling than what is going on in front of me. So it is very important for us to be mindful of the unconscious because this it's what's going on, and that is called splitting. It is when I can only imagine internally the negative piece of that individual. So this is why we need to know what is going on on the inside. So I wonder then, as we come into the academy, especially as professors and also as students, we can look on both sides, we step into the university packing. We bring in research dollars, many research dollars. We bring in accolades, we bring in titles, we are interviewed, we, we are stellar at Case Western Reserve University, right? But what we don't recognize when we step into this university is that just perhaps some of us, maybe not all of us, are also socially unjust because of this and also oppressive and also sleepwalkers. So here we are, lots of research dollars, lots of accolades and titles, yet we have 
internal objects and mental representations of the students who we will soon be teaching that look like this. So I wonder if when we do our interviews, if we should stop and we should ask, how is it that you think about the students that you will eventually be working with? That might be a tough question to ask, so how do we frame that, right? All right, so who is it then that we have at our university. So this is the national data in 2016 for most full-time faculty at universities across the country. This is the makeup of full-time faculty across the country. This is the makeup at Case Western Reserve in 2017. I think there's also a breakdown by male and female. I just couldn't find it. This is the undergraduate student data, 2017. And this is the graduate data in 2017. Did anybody notice anything across the board with the data? Yes. Um, whites are the majority. Okay. Across, across the board. Right. So our faculty and our students mirror each other across the board. Mm -hmm. Now that's no surprise, right? Yes, Catherine. Highly disproportionate to the community it's based in. Highly disproportionate to the community that's based in. Good. Other thoughts? Yes? Um, it seems that there's a little bit more diversity in the student population than there is in faculty. Okay, good, good, good. All right. So now that we know this is where we are, and if our natural optimism bias has anything to do with this, what can we do to reawaken this? I think one of the things that we might be able to do is perhaps do a little bit of rebranding. So our provost, Dr. Benson, is actively seeking to recruit and retain underrepresented minorities or minoritized individuals. And in our case, it would specifically be Pacific Islanders, African American students, Latinx students, multiracial students, and American Indian students. So I wonder if Case Western Reserve University were known as a university university that was actively not socially unjust, not soci socially oppressive, and not sleepwalking, if that would make a difference. You know, if we were a university that actually said out loud, we made a mistake, right? So we were socially unjust. We were a university that was anti-oppressive, and we made these specific mistakes. We were a university that was sleepwalking. But these are the changes that we have specifically put in place. What if we were a university who owned it? And what if we owned it out loud? I think one of the mistakes that we often make, like we try to own something, but we don't want to own it out loud. We just want to like move toward, let's just be socially just. But what, ha what would happen if we owned it first? I think, just like that little girl who was being her best self, I think other universities might actually say, oh, look at Case, mm -hmm. right? So what would happen if we were socially just? Would it make a difference as far as recruitment and retention were concerned? What would happen if we were anti-oppressive? Would it make a difference as far as recruitment and retention are concerned? What would happen if we were no longer sleepwalkers, if we were woke? Would it make a difference as far as recruitment and retention are concerned? So back in 
2015, 2016, when I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay, I created a teaching assessment and desk card. And I created this card, I modeled it after two other types of assessment cards. One of the assessment cards was called the Cultural Intelligence Scale. And the Cultural Intelligence Scale was created, after, created by the Cultural Intelligence Center, which is committed to building bridges and removing barriers for working and relating across cultures. The other card or assessment tool that it was created after was the bench card, which was created after by the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. And their card, the bench card, helped them to assure that their own biases were not influencing their decision to remove children from the custody of their biological parents. So this desk card that I created has two sides. One side helps you to wonder about the specific experience of your student on all levels, beginning with your syllabus. The other side of the card helps you to assess yourself. It helps you to assess three things. One is your motivational intelligence. The second is your cognitive intelligence. And the third is your metacognitive intelligence. As far as motivational intelligence is concerned, it helps you to assess your interest, persistence, and confidence in teaching students who might be different from you. As far as your cognitive intelligence is concerned, it helps you to assess your understanding about how cultures and people groups are the same and different from one another. As far as metacognitive intelligence is concerned, it helps you to assess the degree to which you as a faculty member plans for, remains aware of in the middle of, and checks up after cross-cultural, ethnic, and racial engagements. All right. So the last thought has to do with neurogenesis. So we have rebranding, perhaps the use of teaching the teaching assessment and desk card. And next we have this idea or this concept called neurogenesis. What is neurogenesis? Neurogenesis is when we engage folks whose natural optimism bias is already active. All right, so what is it? Do you all know people, Dawn? You know people who you just like to be around. When you go to their house or when you go to their office, you don't want to leave. You like to be close to them. You like to listen to them. When you're in their presence, you can fall apart, right? And by the time you leave, you might not be 100% put together, but at least you know the direction that you need to go in, right? Neurogenesis has to do with the birth of brand new neurons. That's what neurogenesis is. Neurogenesis occurs when you or I pivot in another direction. When we find ourselves at the fork in the road and we have to make a decision for life or death or right or wrong and we choose right, we choose good, we choose to serve ourselves in a way that's helpful or we choose to serve someone else in the way that's helpful and we feel good about that choice. It happens when we engage students. That is what happened to me at the University of Cincinnati during my first quarter as a student. Of course, my reading level didn't all of a sudden blossom from fourth grade to, oh, you're going to be on the dean's list. It was already there. Neurogenesis occurred for me, right? It just needed to be birthed, right? It was there, it just needed to come out. Right? So here we have the possibility of rebranding, the use of teaching assessment and desk cards, and we also have the possibility of using neurogenesis, working with people who are willing to breathe life into others. There are neuroscientists and I want to tell you a few of their names. 
like Marion Diamond, Joe Dispienza, Jeffrey Schwartz, and others who have shown that our thoughts have remarkable power to change the brain. They say that thinking and choosing can actually change the landscape of our brain, and I dare say the landscape of the brains of others. So we have rebranding and the use of the teaching assessment and desk cards and neurogenesis. Each of these can potentially move us toward the reawakening of our natural optimism bias so that we can move toward being socially just, anti-oppressive, and woke. And dare I say that this changing of the landscape of our own brains will potentially change the landscape of this university, Case Western Reserve. Thank you. All right, any thoughts? The floor is open for questions for Dr. Fletcher. Yes, you had your hand up. Dr. Ben Carson, you're a neurosurgeon. Yes. What fourth grade teacher told him he would become a nun? Mm -hmm. And I got that from one of the first books, Think Big, mm -hmm. about 20, 25 years old. So what you say to a child can make that child yes. in some kind of break. Absolutely. So we can squash very easily that natural optimism bias easily we can so what dr. Lee talked about in her book and the title of the book is switch on your brain is we can wire in and we can wire out because the brain is so class plastic the potential to wire in and wire out is quite easily yes so um, I had the obviously the um, good fortune of being randomly placed in your course <laughs> um, and I've seen the, these app, this application you know in real time as one of your students and so what I feel like as a clinician is that you modeled for us in the classroom how to um, unconditionally accept mm -hmm. what students are saying even if it's problematic mm -hmm. in a way that has like allowed me personally and I know other students to do that with our clients so how do you feel like you're able to use your classroom um, to like model what you're talking about here? So how do I use the classroom to do the work of like modeling, generating those new connections and making those decisions? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Kelly. I think that you can probably answer that question a little better than I can because you were in the classroom. So the question is, did I give you? In the classroom, did I give you space mm -hmm. to, to process? Mm -hmm. And did I give you space to learn and grow? Mm -hmm. Did I give you space to make a mistake, right, mm -hmm. without squashing right. your optimism mm -hmm. as an individual and as a student? Mm -hmm. So only you can answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I do think that, um, so what you modeled when you gave me space but also chose to make sure that we were giving others in, yes. in that space room to do it as well. Correct. Um, and so we can be an echo chamber in social mm -hmm. work and when we would have um, sort of a, a, an opinion mm -hmm. that didn't follow the echo chamber um, where you could have easily like allowed the class to jump on that comment, you didn't and I think that that is what was so speaking to thank yeah. you. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. um, I was just going to ask about whether or not you thought that these things happen can happen individually, or whether they happen simultaneously, or they happen um, back to back. Um, only because when you were talking about rebranding, as far as case, I, the first thing I thought about was National Geographic and how they had issued an apology after decades of um, reporting bias and not accurately um, having a true voice with various communities. And from that, I, from the case studies that I looked at, because obviously I'm in marketing, that's what I look at um, in my free time, um, there was a neurogenesis that happened with the reputation of National Geographic as a result of that. So I was wondering if you thought that maybe neurogenesis could happen on its own, or you need the other two to, for one to happen. I was just curious about. 
that? So I think, I think they have to be intentional. They're just not going to happen by themselves. I think they have to be, I think they have to be intentional, especially the rebranding piece. And it would have to happen because leadership decides that we're going to move forward. And as we move forward with our continued initiatives, that we're going to frame it this way, or we're going to frame it that way. Neurogenesis can happen on an individual level with different instructors, staff members. It can happen with the individuals who are serving food. That is an individual piece because we can pour life into the person we are sitting next to on the bus. It only takes a second. Neurogenesis can happen on an individual level. You're, you think so, Matt? Yeah. Okay. All right. Other thoughts? Yes. Um, so back not many years ago, but a while ago, I was a member of Greek Life on this campus okay. um, as an undergraduate. And Greek Life at Case Western is very much entrenched in, um, oh, thank you. Um, it's very much entrenched in um, agents of change on this campus. A lot of people that are very socially active are in Greek Life. Um, however, I think we can all pretty much agree that um, sororities and fraternities tend to get a bit of a bad rap when it comes to diversity, and it does show because um, many chapters don't have a lot of diversity or don't have a lot of outside opinions to help make them more inclusive and woke. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess starting with this campus, how would you suggest that those um, organizations kind of get their foot in the door? How would I suggest, I want to understand your question. Sure. How would other, like, let's just be specific. Yes. How do we bring Members of the Divine Nine onto this campus. Is that what you're asking? That's yes. Well, 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 that's that's well, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for clarification. This is a question. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess I was asking um, how can, um, I guess, those organizations that have such a history of oppression okay. and of excluding people from other communities mm -hmm. from joining their, their ranks. Um, okay. How do you how do you suggest that we kind of bring that sense of being woke into those organizations? Okay. All right. Okay. That's an excellent question. How do you bring that sense of being woke into your organization? All right. I have a thought. But before you have a thought, yeah, have a perfect. Thought. Pass the microphone up. <laughs> What's your thought? So I'm actually a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, um, which is a national, historically black national mm -hmm. sorority. And I think that what we've done is actually, we've engaged with some of the other sororities on campus mm -hmm. who are predominantly white okay. um, and engaged with them in conversations. We've engaged with them around um, partnering together for social activism um, and you know ways that we can get involved with each other so that would be my first suggestion um, okay. we are here we are present on campus we are present um our particular chapter well the chapter i came through was theta eta mm -hmm. um, we are a cleveland citywide chapter so we are on eight campuses in greater cleveland and i would encourage you to we can talk later if you would like yeah, to um and ways that the conversation can start i think a conversation has been had kind of when we talk about interacting with people um, that we don't know, you kind of have those conversations, get to know them. Um, and that would be my first step, because we're here, there's also Sigma Gamma Rho, um, mm -hmm. and they are the, um, I do not want to say the wrong chapter, um, but they are here on campus as well, and their camp, their sorority and their chapter is specifically on Case's campus, and there are actually undergraduate members that are present here. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Good. So, engaging. Right, good. Any other thoughts? I, yes. I, are we still on now? Yeah, we can stay here. No. No, no, no. Just, you have another? No. No. Oh, no. Okay. Something totally different. Okay, okay so don't lose that. your thought. Any other thoughts about how best to engage or how best to increase wokeness among some of the, yeah. I was going to say a question that um, typically we ask people to challenge themselves with is, um, if you are in a space and it's everybody looks like you, you need to start asking why mm -hmm. it's like that. And I think it goes beyond just fraternities and sororities. I think it goes into office spaces and friendship circles. Because I think if you want to do the work and you want to be a change agent, you can't do that with the same people around you, right? 
Um, and so then the next question is like after you ask, okay, why? Then it's what are you doing? Doing, mm -hmm. um, and it's beyond. I completely agree with my sister over here in like collaboration, and I think collaboration important. But what are you doing personally to understand who is around you? Um, because I always, Donna knows, I, I like to say Google is available, um, and it's important to do the homework and understanding who's around you, what's happening, and how to understand. Um, what's going on around you, so you can have a rich um, circle of people around you. So. All right, so you can ask yourself, why? Why does our circle look like this? Why Why are we sleepwalkers? What, what is it that we are doing? Right, good, good. Any other thoughts? That, that's really interesting. I think that the what you just said, when you ask yourself those questions, the realization has to be, it's not by accident, it's yeah. mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. not just random. There's a reason why, mm -hmm. and that's what you're getting. Yeah. So that's yeah. really good that you said that. Okay. All right. Does that help? Uh, extremely helpful. Thank good. you. Good. All right. OK. No, I just had a question about your definition of anti-oppressive. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering where in that definition would fit the idea of free agency and self-determination in that definition that you have. And so when you're talking about free agency and you said free agency and self-determination self for the individual who is being oppressed, so let's drop it in there, Don. Or even to, like, if you're trying to be anti-oppressive, mm -hmm. recognizing mm -hmm. and validating mm -hmm. the right to self-determination and correct. agency. Correct, correct, correct. So it has to be a part of it. So this definition can become very long, and I think that the definition is actually a working definition because if we are moving toward anti-oppression, we can never be paternalistic, all right? Mm -hmm. So we can never deny someone's... Um, self-determination and we have to make sure that the narrative remains their own and I think that showed up in the uh, socially just piece so it has to be a part of it agreed yep I'm gonna um, stress the elephant in the room and that's money oh. Oh, money, <laughs> money. Um, I, the last slide we talked about the three different things and the first thing that came to mind is how can we as an institution um, and also the community put money towards those ideals, and um, immediately to mind came that Say Yes to Cleveland, which offered scholarships for young people who graduate from Cleveland schools to then go to university, and it's had such good success in, in Syracuse, so when it happened, when it was announced, I got so excited for my clients, but I'm mindful that Case Western is not on that list of approved universities. Um, so this is my, my call out to Case Western <laughs> to uh, consider. Yeah, it is on the list. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the list. Yeah. It's not listed on the website. So maybe that should be part of the rebranding. It should be. I read it on okay. mine when it first happened. So, yay. Yay. <laughs> okay. 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 Good. Good. Other thoughts? If I could do a follow up to that, yes, Case West Reserve is on that say yes list, but how outreaching is this university to go in and get some of those mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we talk about, you know, making those connections, et cetera, that's got to be done. Mm -hmm. Because people around Cleveland are well aware, they have that, that in their mind about what Case Western Reserve University is to people in the neighborhoods. And if we're not reaching out, we're not going to capture them. So thoughts about how to reach out. What is it that we have to do as a university to build those bridges? Uh, what implicit bias. So I know certain universities, or I know for graduate, some graduate schools, they have they have um, like personality <laughs> tests or personality skills, as well as you have the implicit bias um, testing. What are the barriers to instituting those, both on a interviewing skill, like interviewing faculty and professors, and as well as on a student level of when you're applying a case, kind of doing implicit bias training and having a better understanding of the makeup 
those internal thoughts of people? That's a really good question. I don't know, Dr. Bobby. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so I appreciate that question. I, I like all of these questions, really. Uh, but I want to answer that one in particular because Diversity 360, when it's done correctly, has implicit bias in it. I mean, we direct people directly to the website. And currently, it's required for all incoming faculty, all incoming staff, and all incoming students. Perhaps when you went through, you didn't do it. So that's something we can address. I mean, there are, there are other open sessions when people can now do Diversity 360, but the Harvard Implicit Bias Test is part of it. Anybody can do it anytime. All you have to do is go online and go to Harvard Association Test, and it's there. There are 14 modules in the one that we give people on campus, and you can do them all and see where your biases are. But I think that the challenge is we have these intake moments, incoming faculty, incoming students, incoming staff. But people who have been here already, some people try to get a pass. You know, they, they I don't have to take it, I've been here. It, ideally, the whole campus should take it because you need to be exposed. The reality of where we are now in this historical moment in our country, though, not all bias is implicit, not all bias is unconscious. Some of it is explicit, intentional, in your face. Mm -hmm. So we have to be aware of both kinds, of the implicit and the explicit. But um, the test is already available as part of Diversity 360. And maybe we need to think about when you took, if you did Diversity 360. So if you haven't done it, then you can talk to us about an open session and we can be sure that you get to see it. But it is on campus already, and some people have already participated in it. And um, my office does it for all new faculty, so it's part of the new faculty orientation. The good news is Provost Vincent, uh, Vincent wanted to continue that. So everything didn't go away just because he's new. He wants to continue that as part of the orientation for all new faculty. Again, the challenge is for faculty who've been here already. Faculty Senate passed a resolution that all senators would do. And now we've got to get to the rest of the faculty. So there's a lot of work to be done here, which is why I like your point about, you have to admit, we haven't done what we need to do yet. Yeah. We haven't done what we need to do yet. We've begun some of that work, but we have not arrived. And so we need to say, we've got to get to the faculty who haven't done it. Because what I liked about your predictive analytics, if you rely on predictive analytics, you will think that's all you need to do. And that's what happened to your counselor. Mm -hmm. So it's got to go beyond predictive analytics because those can be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so there's work to do about how do we do the curriculum? How do we do syllabi? Our last speaker for Power of Diversity, Dr. Benson, talked about that. How do you do little things like your syllabus? Is your syllabus encouraging? Or is your syllabus meant to foreclose on people's success before they even get started? Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> and I think you were also pointing at if we could do those tests in the interview process. And then an individual would know. Even if we couldn't know, they would know. And then what would they do with that information? Because they would know. So, all right. Any other thoughts? Yes. So going back to building the bridge gap between students and case, the Provo Scholars Program is pretty much an example of that, but with East Cleveland and Case Western Reserve. So basically bringing in inner city children to gain the college experience to perhaps come to Case one day or other colleges of their choice. So hopefully that will expand Hopefully it will expand, and hopefully we will engage with, what's your name? Miranda. Miranda and Amaya and DeVay and Riley and all the rest of you whose names I don't know in such a way that we are not paternalistic, but we are actually coming alongside. I touched you, Maya. I hope that's okay. We're actually coming alongside you in such a way that is helpful and so when you get here you will be a part of changing the landscape 
of this university. And those demographics that we saw up there change as a result of your presence on this campus. Yes. I just want to say about that, Dr. Fagheri is on sabbatical this semester, but yes. Dr. Gary started that yes. program. Yes. And we currently, if I'm not mistaken, have two students who are now matriculating here oh, at the university. Yes. I know we have one. Can somebody correct me? I know we have one. Brianna is one, and I, I think there might be more than one. They are the leader and they are the Right. So it already yes. has a track record of they started in the Provo Scholars Program, and they now are matriculating here. So yes. there's evidence. Yes, yes. <laughs> There was someone in the back. Okay. Any other thoughts? Hello. So you talked about the importance of having an instructor that looks like you for your college experience mm -hmm. and the fact that Case isn't that great at it. So <laughs> at having more diversity in its faculty. So how do we both promote hiring a more diverse workforce and then retaining them? So once we do start to build diversity, there's this overburdening of these mm -hmm. faculty and trying to be on these search committees, trying to build diversity themselves. How do we prevent that overburdening of the early diversity initiatives? So I think that can actually go back to the question that Hannah asked, right? And the suggestions that came through were perfect. We can ask ourselves why. What is it that we are doing, right or wrong, right? And your suggestion also was to make sure we at least engage with others, perhaps people of color, so that they don't necessarily have to sit on that search mm -hmm. committee, but engage with them on some level because we don't want to overburden them because that's exactly what'll happen. Dr. Mobley may, may also be able to speak to that piece or? Uh, yeah, I think you know some of it is what the search committees look like. Um, some of the work has to do with talking to Dean. I just talked to, so my faculty appointment is in English. I just spoke to our, I don't know if his title is acting or interim dean, Tim Bill. I just talked to him today about what else you need to do on search committees. So it's beyond just having a diverse pool. It's having a diverse finalist pool. Some people believe because they have an applicant pool, they're done. It's about your finalist pool, the one, the candidates who get to come to campus, mm -hmm. meet with other faculty, meet with students. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Do you have any diversity in your finalist pool? We can't tell people who to hire. Right. But if you don't go that next step, that's part of the problem. And then being careful about <coughs> committees. Mm -hmm. If you put junior faculty, I've written an article about this actually already. If you, if you put junior faculty on a committee after committee after committee, and then when it's time for them to come up for tenure, ask where is your book, yeah. where are your publications, well that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So you need faculty, you need department chairs, you need deans, department chairs, and so on, looking out for junior faculty before they, they come up. And so that requires some conversations inside departments about how are we going to distribute the labor among us. So that's, again, those are more conversations to have with deans and with departments and I can speak yep. to I can speak to the uh, faculty search process as well uh, I'm the faculty or the faculty diversity coordinator here at the university so any searches that we do any search committees have to have membership that includes minority faculty and or female faculty we require that they do um, outreach to um, minority caucuses, female uh, caucuses in the field, any of those things, we require that they do those before we will approve any um, individual applicant pool because we want to make sure that our, that the opportunities are being made to, made available to as many people as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question, uh, Dr. Fletcher. I, I knew the university joined as part of the corporate relations team, so I'm charged with traveling the country raising money from our corporate investors as well as alumni for a number of programs. I've also been tasked with raising money for initiatives and scholarships around the university. So I need your help. I need to be able to take what you're talking about and apply that 
to the audience that I'm talking to is external. It's yes. not students, it's not yes. faculty, yes. it's corporations, it's mm -hmm. alumni. Mm -hmm. uh, because of Provost Vincent's charge for all of us to begin to benchmark against a number of universities, and he has a specific list that are either our peer group or our peer aspirant group. I think in the week, you know, we just came down in North Carolina to the university and talked about what they're doing. What a lot of the students are telling in terms of fund development particularly with alumni if they need to change the face of their external relations because the demographics of our campus have changed. Therefore, the future donors of the school, when all of these students become probably successful and want to get back to school, will change. So I'm trying to learn how to apply, and that's why I wanted to come here to apply this, this the knowledge you're providing to what I'm doing in practice and I mean, this, making the business case for case and case of diversity. Yes, absolutely. So I think one of the first things that we're going to do is to be sure that we are speaking their language. So we will take our information and translate it into their language so that it makes sense to them. And you and I will connect. Okay? All right. All right. Can we take, oh, we have one more question? Okay. 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 Um, so I, I want to go back and like, piggyback on what Bill asked. Um, but I'm going to take it one step, like previous to the applications and like interviewing and recruiting. So I'm a PhD student here in the neuroscience department, school of medicine. Um, I am the only person that looks the way I do in my entire department. Um, and as far as faculty go, there are no faculty that look like me in the school of medicine, as far as I know, um, which really sucks. And I think it's because mostly of the environment that we work in, where once we're done, we don't want to stay in it. So there's the retention of like people who look like me in academia, especially by of academia. So when it comes time to hire these faculty members, they're not applying. So how can you increase or make people want to apply for these jobs in the first place? That's a tough question. And for us, because I know I don't want to do it, so. Right. And I and I know, like, I want to be a role model for people who didn't have a role model. Like, I'm the only person I know that's doing what I'm doing. Right. Right. But I, I don't want to, like, I don't feel like that's my battle. So for you, and I think it's very similar to the question that you asked, and which was, in the midst of a drought and being woke, how do I keep my natural optimism bias alive? Because you don't want to do it because you don't feel like it's your battle. My gut is one day you're going to say, this is my battle. And you're going to step into that space because there's, there's going to be somebody coming after you. you. See these people behind you? They're going to be right behind you. And they're going to need to. Yeah. They're all gorgeous. They are. They are, they are more than gorgeous. They're more than gorgeous. They're going to need that optimism bias poured into them. They're going to need to see your face. We are still making firsts in this country. And I'm afraid that one day it will be your battle. <coughs> All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Can we thank Dr. Fletcher?